have a very short amount of time to spend together, so we will proceed quickly with introductions. Then I would like to show the video again to set the stage for the further discussion with our esteemed panelists. I think there were a lot of good interventions already made in the video and I'd just like to revisit that. Please feel free to enter questions or comments in the chat box and time allowing, I will bring those to the floor so that our panelists can respond. Without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce Faida Alida. Uh, Faida is a refugee student originally from Rwanda. She is studying in her third year of economics and management studies on a DAFI scholarship in Chad. And Faida joins us from Jamina. Uh, next, Dr. Colin Sayang is Program Director for Plan International, joining us today from Cameroon. Dr. Collins, welcome. And speaking to us from Dakar is my colleague, Charlotte Barquin, UNHCR Regional Education Officer for West and Central Africa. Welcome, Charlotte. Now, um, just a few words from me in framing the refugee education response in West Africa in light of the COVID-19 situation. Nationwide closures across West and Central Africa are impacting millions of refugee and host community children. In many countries in the region, remote learning is a luxury, however, because it assumes access to technology, hardware, and internet connectivity. According to UNESCO, in Sub-Saharan Africa, 89% of learners do not have access to home computers, and 82% do not have internet. To ensure the continuity of learning in a protective environment and to prepare for the safe reopening of schools, UNHCR is working with ministries of education and with education partners and with refugees to support students to access distance education programs, enhance health training for teachers, support community awareness raising activities on COVID-19 and basic prevention measures while upgrading water and sanitation facilities in school, which is of course key. With that, I welcome you to view the video again and pay specific attention to some of the points raised specifically by Dr. Collins and by Faida with respect to the concrete experiences of school closures and trying to maintain education, as well as Charlotte's points about the regional scope and perspective. After this, we will proceed with discussion with the panelists. Now, if I can, let me share my screen. Hi Manal, I'll just point out that the sound is not um, working properly on the video and maybe you can reshare it through a different video sharing option. Hi everyone, I'm very sorry. I've been informed that the sound is not working for some, if not all attendees. So if that is the case, then I would say let's conserve our time and we'll stop the video and rely on our panelists to, to fill us in. With that, I'm sorry that that didn't work. I was, I was able to hear it, so I was really very much enjoying. 
Um, but I think that it will be helpful then to start with Charlotte, um, who in the video gave us a really nice overview of the response on secondary and primary education due both to insecurity in the region, which has obviously been going ongoing for some time, as well as with the rather newer COVID-19 situation. Um, so Charlotte, if I could turn it over to you to also explain more about the overall response in the context of education, and then perhaps some of the ways that refugee students themselves are participating in the response. Thanks. Thanks, Manel. Um, yes, yeah, so as mentioned in the video, well, you, you didn't hear that probably, but we will share the link, uh, the link of the video after. So the combined effect of attacks on education and school closings due to COVID-19, especially in the Sahel region, uh, puts thousands of children at risk of permanent school dropout in the region. And we know that the longer marginalized children are out of school, the less likely they are to return to school, and especially for girls. Um, even when national initiatives have been set up to continue education with distance programs, refugee and forcibly displaced communities are disproportionately excluded from these virtual learning initiatives as they often fail to obtain the devices or live in areas where there is no infrastructure and connectivity necessary to engage properly with this distance initiative. Um, in order to mitigate the longer term consequences of this disruption, UNHCR's education response in the region focuses on ensuring that learning places offer protection and safety by strengthening reception and teaching capacities of schools and on ensuring the continuity of education by providing alternative learning opportunities for refugee learners in particular, but also for children of host communities. Um, for example, thanks to Education Cannot Wait emergency funding for the COVID response, UNHCR is supporting radio education in low resource, low, low, low connectivity sorry, areas, such as in Mali and Burkina Faso, where very few households have access to electricity, TV or internet, and where radio education is one of the few ways children have to continue learning. In Burkina Faso and Mali, we will distribute during the coming weeks over 8,000 solar radio sets accompanied with printed learning material to ensure that refugee, internally displaced and host community children can have access to the distance learning programs broadcasted through national and community radios. While schools are gradually reopening in the region, it is also particularly urgent to support governments in this process to ensure that schools are safe to reopen. Uh, wash facilities, so water um, and sanitary and hygiene facilities, for instance, need to be improved in schools, especially if we consider that it's a very important point for girls' retention at schools. Uh, teachers need to be trained in health and psychosocial support, and additional pedagogical support need to be planned for students who might have fallen behind during um, this period with no education, let's say. Another important point in this COVID response concerns the teachers. It's essential to ensure that teachers continue to be paid in refugee settings in particular, first to ensure continuity of income during times when many other livelihoods opportunities have ceased, but also to not face a shortage of teachers when schools will reopen. And in many refugee settings across the region, teachers and higher education students are also very active in the response. In the refugee camps in Eastern Chad, uh, where 100,000 pupils had to stop schools due to the pandemic, refugee teachers are really going the extra mile to provide students with homework exercises corrected each week, while in urban areas, free classes through WhatsApp and home tutoring sessions are organized by refugee students themselves to help their peers prepare for national exams. 
and um, you will hear more details on that from uh, FIDA just after me. Uh, back to you, Manal. Thank you. Thank, thanks very much, Charlotte. So, Faida, now looking to you, I think that, um, you know, we're aware that there are many challenges that students all over the world are facing, and indeed, Charlotte has highlighted a whole a range of issues that are evident in the region there where you are. Um, could you elaborate on the specific challenges that you or other students that you know faced during the COVID-19 crisis or are facing? Um, and also the ways more about what, the ways students have supported each other and what, what kind of work you've been doing. Thanks, Manal. So I, I'll translate for Faida. Uh, Faida, vos commentaires, uh, dans la vidéo qu'on n'a pas bien entendu, mais uh, ont montré qu'il était très clair que les étudiants du monde entier sont confrontés à de nombreux défis pour poursuivre leurs études pendant la crise de COVID. Est-ce que vous pourriez nous expliquer les plus grands défis auxquels vous ou d'autres étudiants auraient été confrontés pendant cette crise et aussi comment les étudiants euh, se sont impliqués dans la réponse et se sont soutenus entre eux pour surmonter cette situation À vous, Faïda. Faïda, il faut que tu, mettes, que tu ouvres ton micro. Ok, d'accord. Bonjour. Euh, alors, euh, l'une des plus grandes difficultés auxquelles euh, j'ai dû faire face, euh, c'est d'abord euh, l'arrêt des cours, puisque les universités ont été fermées. Euh, le gouvernement avait pris la décision que euh, pour lutter contre le coronavirus, on ferme toutes les universités. Donc, on ne pouvait plus euh, aller aux cours et assister, prendre les cours comme avant. Et l'autre difficulté, c'est que même les lieux de recherche, euh, tels que les centres informatiques ou cybercafés, et aussi les, les bibliothèques ont été fermées. Donc, euh, c'était difficile, il fallait rester à la maison et essayer d'étudier à seul. Et, mais par contre, j'aimerais soulever que, oui, les étudiants étaient assez solidaires parce qu'il y a un groupe WhatsApp qui s'est créé juste après la fermeture des, des campus, euh, un groupe WhatsApp créé par euh, ma classe et aussi un groupe WhatsApp qui a été créé par les étudiants de l'UNICER. Et dans ces groupes, c'est vrai que euh, beaucoup d'étudiants balancent euh, des documents et ils partagent des informations euh, importantes pour, que, pour nous soutenir. Quoi. Mais c'est difficile. C'est difficile parce que euh, euh, l'Internet ici et l'électricité et, et sont, sont comme des luxes ici pour les réfugiés. Et aussi, j'aimerais souligner que euh, pour les élèves, le, le gouvernement a mis en place euh, un système de cours à distance. Donc, euh, il a fait des efforts pour que les élèves, puissent, euh, les élèves de, la, de classe d'examen puissent assister à des cours à travers euh, la, la télé et la radio. Mais comme j'ai dit, beaucoup de réfugiés ne pouvaient pas y avoir accès euh, faute de moyens. Et c'est là, là que nous, on intervient euh, vraiment en tant qu'étudiants euh, réfugiés. Et il y a même des nationaux qui nous aident donc, euh, on donne des cours de soutien à ces réfugiés-là qui, qui, qui passent aussi le bac. On les donne des cours de soutien histoire de les appuyer, histoire qu'ils ne soient pas découragés intellectuellement. Merci, Faïda. Uh, I'll translate in English for our anglophone uh, participants. So, um, uh, Faida is speaking from Chad and she explains that uh, overnight classes have stopped due to the pandemic. Um, research locations such as libraries and cyber cafe have also closed, uh, deprived all students uh, of the possibility to access um, online um, education. Um, She also mentioned that electricity and internet are a luxury for many refugees in Chad, uh, if not all refugees in Chad. Uh, but yet students uh, stay united. Uh, WhatsApp groups, for example, have been organized to help each other to exchange uh, information. Um, yes, and to, to support each other. The national government in Chad has set up a distance learning system via television and radio, uh, only for exam classes. But as mentioned before, many students do not have access to it due to lack of resources. 
Um, one very interesting initiative Faida mentioned is that a free home tutoring program has been set up by uh, refugee students themselves who volunteered to allow uh, pupils in uh, exam classes, so for example, the ones who are preparing the baccalaureate, to continue their education, to receive some help, uh, and not to be discouraged and um, and success to pass their exams. Uh, currently, tw 20, 20 students are helping uh, more than uh, 100 students uh, to study for this exam. Back to you, Manal. Thanks, Faida. Thanks, Charlotte. Merci, Faida. Um, it looks like we've lost Collins for the moment, so um, we will wait until hopefully he rejoins. Um, I just wanted to reflect really quickly. I think that Bahati earlier also mentioned um, sort of the mental health stress of being caught up in this pandemic and, and with FIDA reflecting on the uncertainty that students are experiencing. I think that access to information we've seen underlined and underscored throughout the, throughout the pandemic and the response. Um, that, that students were definitely feeling anxious, and teachers for that matter, also feeling anxious about what was coming, what was going to be expected as, as um, students prepare to go back to education and back to school. There's also anxiety amongst the families as to the safety of the students, the safety of the staff, um, everyone involved. And so I guess, Charlotte, I'd love to turn back to you and, and just ask if there are any reflections as yet on the preparations for back to school and what's, what timeline you're looking at and whether there are any concrete considerations. Thanks, Manel. Yeah, so as quickly mentioned um, earlier, so here in the Western Central Africa region, schools are progressively uh, reopening. Uh, the plan in most countries is to reopen only exam classes so both at end of primary and at end of secondary level uh, and for the ongoing school year, and then to resume all the grades uh, in September, October, at the beginning of the new school year. Um, it's really important to support this reopening process because, as you said, there are a lot of anxiety among students and families, um, and also among the, the education community. So what we are doing concretely is um, to support teachers. One, one important thing is to support both schools and teachers actually. One important thing is um, all around improving wash infrastructures. So wash infrastructure include latrines, but also hand washing devices for teachers and students, uh, providing uh, water, soaps, everything. So uh, teachers and students feel safe in the in the school they can wash their hands they can have access to um, washable masks for example they can have access to yes hand washing device um, uh, hydroalcoholic gel whatever they they need to feel um, healthy safe in the school another important part is the, the teacher training uh, teacher training so in health, teacher training in prevention, but also teacher training in PSS because we know that uh, some children uh, have stayed home for months. They will resume school with for some high level of stress and teachers need to be prepared to accompany them, to support them. Uh, to design specific PSS activities to resume education activities smoothly, let's say. Um, and I had a third point. Um, yes, a third point to, to support the reopening of schools is uh, also linked to teacher training to make sure that teacher will be able to include all children and we know that these children will resume school with very different um, background of access to distance learning opportunity during these months of school closure. So we'll probably face, and this will be difficult for teachers, that will face uh, high heterogeneity in the student's level when they will be back to school. So additional, they, they should be prepared to, to provide students with additional support when needed. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Charlotte. Obviously, the, the response has changed from the onset of 
of the emergency to now shifting towards looking to go back. And, and at both stages, there were so many layers of considerations that, that have to come together into the whole picture. Um, Faida, if I, can, if I can turn to you now, and again, Charlotte, I'll ask you to, to translate. Um, I just wanted to hear your reflections a bit, Faida, on the, um, the issue of transition from secondary education to tertiary education, because we know that you're one of the very few individuals who has access to a scholarship for university. And I, I wondered if you could say something about um, what it means to know that there's an opportunity um, out there and, and what it means for you as you interact with younger students and trying to encourage them and make sure that they stay in school and stay engaged even through stresses and, and uncertainties like this one. Can you translate for me, Charlotte? Yes, no problem, but I'm I really sorry. I just lost the few seconds of your question because I had an internet connectivity problem. No problem. I just was wondering if, if Ida could reflect a bit on the, the transition from secondary education to tertiary education and what it means to have mentors like her who are in higher education already, even through disruptions, whether it's violence, whether it's school closures, what have you. Thanks. Faida, uh, la question de Manal concerne essentiellement le passage entre l'éducation secondaire et l'éducation tertiaire. Toi, tu as eu la chance de pouvoir avoir une bourse d'affi pour accéder à l'université. Qu'est-ce que ça veut dire uh, pour toi et pour les, les étudiants que tu les élèves, que tu aides en ce moment, uh, de, de pouvoir avoir cette opportunité de support pour pouvoir uh, avoir les examens de fin de secondaire et pour pouvoir accéder au tertiaire Qu'est-ce que ça représente à ton sens en termes d'opportunité et de besoin aussi Ouvre ton micro, Faïda, s'il te plaît. D'accord. Merci. Merci. Euh, donc, euh, pour moi, le fait d'avoir la bourse, d'abord, ça a été un grand soulagement euh, parce que euh, avant d'avoir même la bourse, je n'étais pas informée de l'existence euh, de la bourse d'affi. Euh, J'avais fini ma terminale et euh, je m'apprêtais juste à rester là à la maison et passer un an et espérer que l'année prochaine, je, je m'inscrive. Mais heureusement, pour moi, j'avais une bonne moyenne et j'ai essayé, j'ai tenté parce que j'avais eu une bourse Turquie, mais malheureusement, c'était pour juste les, 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 la, la, les Tchadiens, quoi, la, pour les, les gens de, voilà, de, du pays. Donc, euh, j'avais déposé au HICR, essayé de voir s'ils pouvaient m'arranger ça et c'est là que j'ai été informée qu'il y avait la bourse d'Afi. Et comme ils ont vu que j'avais une belle moyenne, ils m'ont donné ce, cette bourse. Et donc, euh, ça a été un grand soulagement pour moi, pour ma famille. Parce que cette bourse, c'est pour aller étudier, mais aussi, ça te donne les moyens de complètement te concentrer dans tes études. Et, et donc, euh, moi, vraiment, je, je suis très contente d'avoir eu cette bourse. Et maintenant, quand je fais le tutorat, en allant, par exemple, chez les élèves, euh, je les donne aussi cette opportunité de connaître cette bourse. Parce que beaucoup ne connaissent pas encore que la bourse d'Afi existe. Donc, euh, je les donne les moyens de ne pas de se décourager intellectuellement mais plutôt de, de, de persévérer et d'essayer d'être excellent. Parce que nous avons la bourse d'AFI, nous avons aussi la bourse Miss Migration. Ça veut dire que ça paye juste la scolarité sans les frais de location et tout. Et après, nous avons aussi le HICER a signé des partenariats avec les universités du Tchad, au moins ce 6, où on peut aller s'inscrire à 50% de taux réduit. Donc, euh, je pense que ça soulage beaucoup de, de, de réfugiés. Et quand ils attendent ça, ils ne baissent pas les bras, mais plutôt ils continuent parce qu'ils savent que, oui, ils peuvent aller loin. Merci beaucoup, Faida. So, um, Faida was saying that uh, for her, obtaining the DAFI scholarship was actually a great relief. Um, she could have had access to this opportunity thanks to her good academic results. And uh, yes, it was really a relief for her and, um, and her family to know that she would be able to continue her study and to become self-reliant. And now with regards to um, doing the home tutoring for other students, uh, other pupils in Chad, um, she mentioned that it's also an opportunity for her to give information on the different scholarship opportunity that actually exist in Chad to other pupils. So they, uh, they have the motivation to continue the study and they have hope that they will be able to continue even beyond secondary and access higher ed education. 
Back to Manal. Bon, merci, Faida. Merci, Charlotte. Collins, I see you've joined us again. I'm so glad, which means that you get the final word. And, and I, we really